Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Ketchkamethi. I'm the executive director of the American Academy of Political and Social Science in beautiful Philadelphia. Uh, the format of today's program is going to be that we're going to quickly turn things over to Professor Robert Cohan, who's our moderator for the day. Um, but before that, we'll hear from the president of the American Academy, Ken Pruitt. Um, and then beyond Ken's comments, uh, we're going to hear from Professor Nordhaus for about 15 minutes of comments of his, and then we'll go into a, a little bit more of a lengthy moderated discussion among the panelists led by Professor Cohen. And then uh, we'll have uh, a discussion after that, the, the question and answer portion of the program. The webinar today is being recorded, and we're going to email a link of that recording along with any of the documents that we share today to all of you after the webinar. Uh, please do follow the uh, Academy on Twitter using, using the hashtag uh, Academy Meets. And please feel free to ask questions throughout the discussion. We'll have the Q&A session uh, at the end of the event. To ask a question, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical issues, just use the raise hand function and a member of our team is gonna reach out to you and make sure that we get that addressed. So now I'll hand it over to uh, Professor Ken Pruitt of Columbia University and most recently back at the US Census Bureau. Uh, he's the president of the American Academy and has been leading us now for the last six years. Thanks for joining us, Ken. The program's yours. It's my pleasure, of course, to um, uh, start by welcoming uh, Bill Nordhaus of Yale University. Uh, obviously this audience, which is an audience concerned about climate, uh, climate crises, shall we call it, um, for, for all of us, Bill is a household name. Uh, he has the uh, huge distinction um, of, of being a Nobelist. He sees around the corner. He sees things coming before the rest of us do uh, see them coming. And, um, uh, and that remarkable capacity is why it's such a delight to also um, uh, announce him as the Daniel Patrick Moynihan Prize winner this year. Um, of, of the Academy. Academy. Um, a word or two about the, the late Senator Moynihan. He was a giant to all of us, um, though at least for some of us, not including myself, he was not always a saint, um, but he had the distinctive capacity to be both a social scientist and a gifted public servant simultaneously. Uh, he never started, never stopped doing his, his analytic work and bringing it to public attention. And um, he, he, he had simultaneously was always advancing the public good, uh, working in uh, both as an international player when he was in, in India, and then of course domestically, as everyone probably knows. Um, and, um, and, and in some respects, Bill is a particularly important recipient of this because of Bill's own capacity to bring his, his intellectual analytic skills, perspectives and methods of economics to create a, a lot of the models and tools that today we rely on as we try to reverse uh, the, climate, the climate change. Um, Bill, I wanna say that we regret we are not having our gala event normally associated with winning the Moynihan Prize um, and that also includes, by the way, which I now do on behalf of the Board of Directors, to elect you as a fellow of, of the Academy. Um, so for, from us, uh, the Board and the Associate of the uh, Academy, uh, congratulations, obviously, on both your fellowship and on winning the, the Moynihan Prize. Um, uh, in a moment, I will turn to our moderator and panelist. Um, I want to say from the beginning, none of the panelists would be joining this event if they lacked a long and impressive CV. And I want to simply announce they all do have one. And that's all I'm going to say about their CVs because it would go on and on and on. And I skipped the detail therefore on that. Um, I want to say that uh, Bill, of course, addressed some of his own work, not least we expect um, his well-known carbon tax um, strategy and, and obviously whether it can get traction in the, in the new uh, uh, administration. Uh, Bob Cohan will then moderate the panel. Uh, not everyone may realize that Bob, who's a long distinguished political scientist, of course, uh, recently at Princeton, um, 
he um, he's turned his attention um, to with with his customary analytic intensity and his broad reach to um, the issue of policy and climate change, uh, not just at Princeton, his base, but also by a special role at the Center for the Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. In his own work, he has asked how specific bounded regimes fit into census policy in contrast to trying to get to a comprehensive integrated regime uh, for, for the, indeed the entire world, at least at the nation, national state level. Um, there will be three panelists. I start with David Victor from the University of Chicago, San Diego, also the Brookings Institution. And he has, by the way, co-written uh, with Bob. David is well known for his analysis of international cooperation, its strengths and its weaknesses in the policy sphere. See, for example, his recent making climate policy work. Rachel Kayak is a Dean of the Fletcher School has looked at the international options from the vantage point of being a heavyweight international player herself. Um, she had years at the World Bank's climate program and is now a major voice as a member of the UN Secretary General's Advisory Group on Climate Action. Catherine Harrison is a trained chemical engineer who then turned her attention to political science is currently at the University of British Columbia. She specializes in climate and energy policy as you would expect but especially at the local level. That is global solutions need traction at the local level if our policy goals are to be uh, realized. So in, in summary of this, um, of this remarkable group of people who are now going to instruct us for the next hour and a half, um, we have to deal with the whole question of at what level of analysis and, and what level of policy um, uh, uh, capacity and, and, and intensity can we work? How do we get the whole earth uh, to cooperate? Uh, do we have to start at the local level and build up? Uh, can we use something like a, a, a carbon tax to whip the entire behavior of a country uh, into shape and so forth? So you'll see a lot of very informed going back and forth about the, uh, the issue of, 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 of how do we use this current moment um, uh, as we're sort of watching climate change do its damage um, in, in the, fl the floods, the fires, and so forth. Um, and so I turn it over to you, Bob. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Tom and, and Ken, for the introductions. Uh, we are honored to have William, William Nordhaus here with us today as the recipient of the Daniel P. Moynihan Prize in, uh, of the American Academy of, of Political and Social Science, and as our principal speaker. Our, the Academy does not merely honor its speakers, it challenges them. So uh, this afternoon, we will hear for 15 minutes from Professor Nordhaus, uh, and then we will open a discussion with our, our distinguished panel. I will, each, uh, I will ask each panelist in turn a question, uh, which they can respond to in five minutes, and then we'll have a general discussion of that question for five more minutes, moving on to a series of, of four questions altogether. After that, we will open the floor for our audience, and that should be about 10 minutes uh, past the hour, uh, whichever hour it is for you. So I will start with Bill Nordhaus. Bill, thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to hearing you. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Bob, for the introduction. Thank you to Ken and uh, Tom and the Academy for this great honor and the uh, privilege to speak today. I'm, I'm doubly honored by being a recipient of the award and being elected as a fellow of the Academy. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, give some reflections on issues of climate change. And there were four things I'd like to say in the time that I have. Uh, first, I'd like to just note that we've made little progress in slowing emissions so far globally. Uh, I'll talk about some of the uh, role, important role of carbon pricing in this. Uh, I want to open up a slightly different topic and talk about the important challenges uh, that face uh, and poor incentives that face low carbon technologies, and then the need to uh, find different mechanisms for international climate policy, which I call the climate club. And what's interesting about all these three topics is these are all uh, plagued by externalities. Uh, deep externalities, global externalities, externalities that reach far into the future, 
which make them particularly difficult. And in some cases, they have even what's called a double externality. So let me start. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, if I can, and it's all right. Now, what uh, this is supposed to do, if it does do it, is you can see the screen and also a little video of me, so you're not just looking at the screen. So this is the title of today, which is National and International Policies for Slowing, for slowing uh, Climate Change. So the first point I want to make is a little progress on emissions reductions. And this is, this is a uh, graph of emissions through 2019. 2020 is obviously an unusual year, so I don't even put it in. But what you can see is going back to the turn of the last century, the steady growth, about 2.5% per year globally in emissions. And the key thing, if you look at the upper right, is there's been very little, if any, slowdown in emissions in the last few years. Again, this is through 2019. Uh, to reach our targets, the targets of international policy, such as the two, and a half, the two or one and a half degree C, that needs to turn sharply downhill uh, after 2021. Um, and um, that is not yet in sight. So that's the first thing I'd like to emphasize, and it will come back later when I talk about carbon pricing, is that policy so far has really not made a dent or not a significant dent on the trend of carbon emissions. Uh, now, uh, the second point I'd like to make is the importance of harmonized carbon prices. Uh, carbon prices or carbon taxes are now uh, well known, I think, among this audience, so I don't need to spend a great deal of time on them. But th what I'd like to emphasize is that the high price on CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions is the key to sharp emissions reductions. It's the key to sharp emissions reductions. It's not the only thing, but I think it's, an, it's not sufficient, but I think it's necessary if we're going to attain our goals. Now, what that means is we need to have a high price of CO2 and the prices will vary according to different modeling efforts from 40 to $100 a ton of CO2 at the present time. But just as important is that they need to be harmonized and they need to be equalized across industries and across countries. We can't have different prices, vastly different prices in different countries and different sectors. That's wildly inefficient and it's also very ineffective. Now, the reality is I'm gonna show you in a second is that carbon prices are muddled, they're fragmented and they're low. They don't meet the test of power and they don't meet the test of harmonization. So let me show you, uh, I understand there may be some guests today from the World Bank. Let me just reduce my size here a little bit. And this is, this is from the latest report of the World Bank, uh, the 2020 report. Uh, and what it shows is, well, it shows confusion, but let me explain it for a second. These show the different regimes around the world. And you can see if you look closely, this is, this is a little bit cut because some Switzerland and Sweden are, are sort of off the map here. But on the vertical axis is the carbon price in a country or regime. And on the horizontal axis is the share of emissions that is covered by that regime. So for example, if you take the ETS, which is, uh, this is out of date because the price is lower, but if you take the ETS, which is the big green bubble in the middle here, that's the cover has the biggest coverage. It has a relatively low price. It's now up closer to fifty dollars, but when this was published, it was around fifteen dollars. And it co but it only covers half of EU emissions. Uh, if you look at other examples, Quebec and California have relatively low prices and relatively high coverage. Uh, and then others such as Poland or Argentina have both low prices and low coverage. Now, the point I want to make is that whatever what we really would like to see is we'd like to see high prices and high coverage. And basically, there's not, we're not there yet. We have fragmented different prices in different countries, and we have relatively low coverage. And so that's one of the issues 
uh, that we are facing. Now, the carbon, if you take the average carbon price of these, all these countries, it's about somewhere between two and three dollars a ton. So compared to what is needed for an effective climate policy, it's essentially rounds to zero. It's actually less than zero, as you'll see in the next slide, but it basically rounds to zero. It's not only low, but it's fragmented across the different countries. And one final point that makes it difficult is that it is largely concentrated in motor fuels. So if you take the United States with, with which most of us are familiar, uh, the US actually has something that looks like a carbon tax, but it's concentrated in motor fuels, gasoline, diesel fuel, and it's also concentrated in automobiles through automobile efficiency standards. Those are not really carbon prices, but they're like carbon prices in the sense that they raise, have implicit carbon prices. I want to say one other thing before I move to the next slide, which is when I, years ago, I used to talk loosely carbon price, carbon tax, it's all the same. But I think as we get closer and closer to doing this, we need to be a little clearer. The key point is not a tax, but a price. We need to put a price on CO2 emissions. And whether it's a cap and trade system, which many countries seem to like, or a tax, carbon tax, which other countries seem to like, uh, a, car, a cap and trade system is one that is, that is tailored for the EU because of its structure of its governance. Uh, Canada likes the carbon tax proposal, all the provinces look differently. So it's different in different countries. But the key point is that these are prices and they both have the effect of raising the price. Now, one of the things that um, people in the, in the business of looking at fossil fuels and energy prices know is that these are taxes, but also there are other mechanisms by which we affect use. And those include subsidies, in particular fossil fuel subsidies. They include um, uh, regulatory policies, such as regulations on automobiles or buildings. And they include uh, standards, renewable fuel standards. And so the next slide gives you a little picture of what that looks like. So these are carbon taxes and subsidies in 2019, as best as uh, I can reconstruct them. I've told you about carbon prices, which are about $2 a ton of CO2, average across the world. But if you then go a little deeper and you ask, well, what about carbon, what about fossil fuel subsidies? If we look at those, they're actually very deep and very large. And if you look at the dollar value of fossil fuel subsidies around the world, they come to about $10 a ton of CO2. Now, the good news is that carbon prices are going up and fossil subsidies are going down, but the bad news is that they still average up to a, a negative number. Now, there are two other mechanisms by which we can affect CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. One are what are known as feed-in tariffs. Those are ones where you blend together different kinds of generation, say renewable generation and fossil generation, and in effect subsidize the, the renewables. Uh, we don't have good estimates of that, but they might be in places where they're in effect, they might be in the order of five to $20 a ton of CO2. So that's basically in the electrical sectors in some countries. And then the other one, which is actually the most important is the regulatory, which in which uh, you have um, regulations such as fuel efficiency standards. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is the inadequate investment in low carbon technologies. And here the issue is that the public return on innovation is so much greater than the private return. And it's even worse for problems like climate or low carbon technology because there's not only the normal innovation externality, that the ret public return is so much greater than the private return, but there's also a climate externality because when the private sector does invent a new technology, the value of the carbon dioxide reductions or other reductions is undervalued. So for CO2 and other low carbon technologies, we have a double externality at work here, which leads to vastly inadequate research and development on low carbon technologies. And this is something where we've not 
we could we could talk more about this, but we haven't paid a lot of attention. Uh, one part of this is easily fixed. One of the point about carbon prices, which is sufficient, insufficiently understood, is that carbon prices, by raising carbon prices, you fix half of the innovation externality, which is the one on the pricing, but you also need enhanced incentives for low carbon technology. Sometimes I ask, um, I ask an audience, do you think we should be spending as much on green technology or as much on, I'm sorry, do you think we should be spending the same amount or more or less on green technologies as we do on military in R&D? And usually when I ask, when we have a poll or something like that, I'll ask that question. And more than, more than half the people think we should probably be spending more on green technologies and, and advanced energy and renewables. But it's yet interesting to look at what we actually do in our public policy. And the next slide shows that. Uh, those who know this will not be shocked, but those who don't may not be shocked. If you look at federal R&D in 2018, uh, defense and nuclear weapons security research and development was in the order of $60 billion a year, and advanced energy and renewables was almost invisible, perhaps two or $3 billion a year. All of these are subject to accounting issues, but the key point is, whereas defense is, is very, very adequately funded at the, at the federal level, advanced energy and renewables is not. The final issue I want to raise is on climate treaties, and here, uh, uh, the issue is that our international agreements have been plagued by the fact that they are voluntary agreements. And that is one of the reasons why we've made very little progress in slowing emissions. And effective international agreements need some kind of incentives for countries to participate and to spend the necessary dollars and resources for abatement. And I've called this a climate club and it, it involves two features. One is it involves some kind of target. I think the easiest target to construct would be a carbon price, something like $50 per ton of CO2, maybe growing at three or 4% a year or 5% a year. But the new feature, which is absolutely necessary to give it teeth to make it what Scott Barrett calls an incentive compatible treaty is to have a, some kind of penalty on those who don't join or those who don't comply. And what I've suggested in this particular study was a penalty tariff on non-participants or people who don't meet their, their ag agreement of a 3% uniform tariff. Not a countervailing duty on carbon content, but a 3% uniform tariff. And the point about this is this such an approach would rep represent, would replace what I call the empty voluntarism of current agreements from Kyoto through Copenhagen through Paris with inter international environmental law and international trade law. If I'd like, I'd just like to finish up by saying something about uh, Pat Moynihan. I, I did not know him. I admired him very greatly. And I think that one of the things I admired most about him was um, something that many people don't appreciate. And that was his diplomatic skills uh, as, a, as a diplomat and as ambassador. And one of, the, one of the points he emphasized, which I think really is one that I would emphasize in thinking about climate treaties is the importance of international law. And so uh, I, he asked, what do we believe in? And I'll just read his quote. This is from 1983, but it could have been written this morning. The current disorientation in American foreign policy derives from our having abandoned for all practical purposes, the concept that international relations can and should be governed by a regime of international public law. But if we don't believe in law, as he thinks we don't, then what we do, what do we believe in? So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and again, a great honor to be here. And I look forward to the panel. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Bill, for a wonderful talk and very concise. Uh, Bill, I want to ask you two clarifying questions before I turn to the first question to the panel. Uh, could you say first a few more words about the double externality, how the climate externality is different from the public goods one, 
And secondly, can you explain to, uh, to us why you propose a uniform tariff for your climate club as opposed to a countervailing duty or some sort of carbon border adjustment? Uh, sure. On the first one, the point about, in, about innovation in low carbon technologies is the double externality here is this. First, every innovation, every invention that we've known from, from the first history of ideas, uh, going back to say Duke Sawyers and Stillman, is that the social return on these innovations or inventions is much higher than the private return. You can just take the example of the of the uh, COVID vaccines that we are enjoying, some of us are enjoying right now. Uh, those were invented by scientists, according to a panel of uh, public health uh, scientists and economists. Uh, a month earlier is worth 500 billion to a trillion dollars a month, early, uh, early vaccine arrival. But if you ask, what did the inventors get? Even the companies like Moderna, they only get a small fraction of that. So that's the first externality. But even on top of that externality for something like an underpriced public good, such as CO2, you have another externality, which is when you do invent something, it's not gonna be worth very much because the externality that you're working on is underpriced. And I'll give you a simple example of that, which is carbon capture and sequestration. If a company is to now invest billions of dollars in developing carbon, a, uh, a process for carbon capture and sequestration, that already they're not gonna capture all of that. But it's even worse because if they do capture the carbon and they do sequester it, then it's not worth anything because the price on CO2 is, uh, is zero. Now it's not zero everywhere, but it's way below its social cost. So that's what I mean by the double externality. And so that's why this particular aspect is, is difficult. But I also wanna add that you can correct half of that. You can correct the carbon pricing half of it by raising the carbon price to the social cost. The other one is more difficult. So let me go to your second question, Bob, if you can repeat that for, for me as well as the audience. Okay, uh, uh, the second question is why you go for a uniform tariff in uh, as opposed to a countervailing duty or, or, or a carbon border adjustment in punishing those who, or, or in, levying it on those states that did not join the carbon club? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I, I, I've looked at both of those. And the answer, uh, the answer there, are two, there are two parts of the answer. The first one is that it's much more effective to have a uniform tariff. And I'll give you an example. Uh, if you're doing a, a countervailing duty, that will have no impact on non-traded goods. And since one of the largest sectors that have carbon intensive sectors, electric, a generation, uh, that's one that you want to particularly have an impact on. So the point of that, this is not actually to hit for specific sectors, but to give incentives to a country. Mm -hmm. Now, the other point, which is equally important, is that it's easy to administer. If any of you have tried to design a, um, or think about the design of a countervailing duty, you simply have to ask, how far do you go in the input-output matrix? Do you stop with the first, which is actual carbon, do you go the next round, maybe petrochemicals which contain carbon? What about the steel that's in the automobile? What about the, the carbon that's in the coal, the carbon that's in the coal, that's in the electricity, that's in et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it just, the uniform tariff is much simpler. Uh, I, do, I do recognize, it's very clear that these have different problems with respect to international agreements, international trade agreements. And those are, that's one of the downsides that has problems with issues of retaliation. But um, that, comes, that comes with the territory of trying to solve this problem. There are many, many difficult problems such as that. But there's no doubt that the, 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 uh, the countervailing duty is just, it's a very, very weak instrument in providing the kind of incentives that are needed. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. So um, I, I'm going to ask my first general question that this goes to our panelist, David Victor. Uh, and the question is, Professor Nordhaus has proposed a price on carbon implemented through a tax or some other arrangement accompanied by a climate club. I want to ask about the political feasibility in your judgment of this proposal. The European Union, Sweden, California, and now Canada have enacted measures that generate a carbon price, as Bill has shown of various magnitudes. Uh, by contrast, President Biden's climate plan is focused on infrastructure and R&D with no mention of a carbon price. How should we account for this omission, this uh, contradiction between what Bill has lucidly laid out as the economic 
logic and the political reality, at least for now. What does this variation in, in policy that I mentioned suggest about the politics of a carbon tax in wealthy pluralistic democracies? So David Victor gets five minutes for this and then we'll have, have Bill have a response and then others can chip in. Great, well, thank you very much, Bob and congratulations, Bill. And I wanna do a shout out as well to the institution where we first met the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which is one of those places where people can work on problems and not worry too much about disciplines. And it was good training for working on the climate change problem. So it's really terrific to see you again. I wanna say two things. Um, first about um, the carbon pricing regime, where I think the logic of uh, economy-wide prices, the economic efficiency that comes from that, um, the logic is, is extremely compelling. And of course, the politics are, are really hard because everything we like about market instruments, fungibility across different sectors, um, transparency, um, uh, that, that's you know, a nightmare for politicians who are trying, who are in the business in some sense of manipulating the flow of costs and benefits to, to groups with different degrees of, of political organization. So I think the why it's hard politically is easy to understand. That's not, that's not news. There are a lot of things in life that are hard and one just has to deal with it. And um, uh, so maybe that's the case here. To me, as a political scientist, what's more interesting is that the politics vary across different, different sectors. So you look, um, for example, the transportation sector where, where people know to a decimal point what the price of gasoline is, the politics of, of using explicit carbon pricing in that sector, those politics are very, very difficult. Whereas in, in the in uh, fixed assets, in the electric power sector, for example, we've seen, the, Europe is the great example right now, we've seen where it's quite possible to have quite substantial carbon pricing. And then there are other instruments that can be used to manage the political transition and to make that feasible uh, the feasible over time. So I think that explains why, in, in your phrase, we see carbon pricing right now as muddled, fragmented, and, and low, is you see a big variation across sectors, in part because the politics uh, uh, and administration to some degree, but I think it's actually a political, uh, a political story. And I think that's also the intuition behind the rising popularity of sector-based policies, uh, including what the Biden administration is proposing. And let's, you know, let's not be too generous to other governments around the world, um, Sweden, Norway, the entire EU. Yes, they have pricing mechanisms, but when you look behind the curtain, actually most of the work for emissions reduction in most of the sectors is actually being done by non-pricing non uh, instruments, by regulatory instruments in one way, in, in one way or another. So I think that's, that's not a statement of what would be the ideal world. It's a statement about the messier real world that seems to have evolved. And we probably need to talk some about these two worlds that are now, that are, that are now, uh, that, that are no, now evolving. I live in California and it's to me interesting to observe that in California, we have a pricing mechanism where the price is $18 a ton. So essentially no impact on behavior whatsoever. And yet, depending on the sector you're looking at, in the power sector, we have policies that are $70 or so a ton. And uh, in, in the transportation sector, we have now policies that are reliably $200 a ton. They just don't translate back into the pricing mechanism. So I think that's, that's a world we may not be comfortable in. That's the real world of politics. And that's the, the first point I wanted to, uh, the, the first point that I wanted to, to make. The second point is about, the, is about the clubs. And I think your analysis is exactly right. We've spent 30 years engaged in diplomacy around climate change, and we've achieved almost nothing because we've been trying to get global agreements where everyone has to provide consent. They're essentially voluntary efforts. I think Paris is maybe a little bit of a step forward because it's, it's designed for more flexibility, but it's a marginal step forward on the, on the previous arrangements. We're not gonna make progress on this problem without, without, uh, some, with, without smaller groups, very strong incentives. So, so there, I agree completely. I do think, maybe especially in a, in a session devoted to Patrick Moynihan, I do think the problems of the uniform tariff are pretty significant. And so what we're gonna see in the real world, and we're actually seeing right now, especially in Europe, is more attention to, to countervailing tariffs and to border carbon adjustments. And that's, I think, for good trade law reasons. Frankly, the international trading arrangements have generated massive benefits to the world. And I would be very concerned about something, climate change is also a very serious problem. I'd be very concerned about something where we you know, inadvertently blew up the global trading arrangements in order to address climate change and then destroy these other benefits that, have, that, that are flowing globally because of lower tariffs and more open markets and so on. So that seems like a manageable problem. But I wanna close by saying, 
that to the extent that people believe what I said in my first remarks, that the politics point us in the direction of sector by sector approaches, of the greater use of regulatory instruments rather than market based instruments, not because people weren't awake in economics 101, but because they were awake and they were concerned about the politics of that to the extent that happens then the border adjustments are going to be a lot messier. The administration issues that Bill raises are really, really serious problems because the real border adjustments are going to have to not only deal with the input-output table, but they're also going to have to deal with a, with a mixture of market instruments where at least we can trace the price effects through the input-output table and regulatory instruments where it's harder to figure out, in effect, the tariff equivalent. But I think that's the world we're in, and we probably need to start working on that much harder running real tests and experiments so that we can develop border measures that withstand trade law scrutiny and are also effective because exactly as Bill says, we're not gonna make progress on the problem. Thinking about this as just a global kumbaya agreement, we're gonna to have to work in smaller groups that are compelled to get something done and to punish those that don't. So, so David, why couldn't one turn to the WTO and devise a, a, a mechanism a, mechanism like bills, which is much simpler, a, a, a value added tax, uh, a, a uniform tariff, but make it only uh, applicable if it were approved by a panel of the WTO as legitimately responsive to a difference in costs of manufacturing and other costs generated by carbon price differentials. Why couldn't one do, one do that? I, I think that's totally feasible, but, but, but I, because that, that is what the border carbon adjustment is trying to do. It's trying to not apply a uniform tariff to all countries, whether or not they're in or out of the club, but it's trying to adjust the trade effects due to the differential pricing and other kinds of regulatory arrangements. And all of that is completely consistent with the history of trade law in this area. So I think the people who, who have raised concerns that, that's, that a border adjustment is not going to be feasible uh, under trade law, those concerns are completely unfounded. The, the real issues are administration. Okay, Bill, your your chance to respond. Well, I I agree with virtually I would say everything that David said. Um, I, I would just put it I just put it in slightly different words. Harry Truman said, "I'm so tired of the economists saying on the one hand this, on the other hand that." Uh, this is a one-handed point. I mean, everything we know in economics says. You want, this is a global public good. There's no differentiation between the carbon dioxide molecule that I emit and one that you emit or one that somebody in Southeast Asia emits and they ought to all have the same price. And that's just simple, 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 simple. And so that's what we ought to work to. I, everybody knows we don't get to perfection. We don't have a free trade regime. We don't have a uniform income tax system. Lots and lots of places where we fall short. But I think it's actually some, it's an area where it's nice to know what a goal is. It's nice to know what an efficient regime would look like. So you can look at something you say, yes, this is, this is a better regime than that. So that, that would be the first point. Then the second thing on uh, these, these penalties. So I, I agree with David about the need for something. I think what, I think what people don't realize is how weak the countervailing duty mechanism is in terms of an incentive. It, it may help balance the trade, but it, it's a very weak mechanism. If you, if you have very large uh, carbon price differentials across borders, that's going to be a big problem. The way to solve the trade problem is to get the carbon prices equalized across borders, and then you don't even need to think about any countervailing um, duties. So um, I think that technical issues are, are also, I agree with it, the technical issues are very difficult. Um, I think there have been some serious issues, some serious questions raised about the dangers of, of some kind of tariff retaliation for non-members. I've discussed this with trade economists. I thought when I first raised this, I was like, well, that's just terrible, dangerous, you know, you're, I just thought everyone said this is a terrible idea. But I talked to people, my colleague, Alessio Zadio, who was president of Mexico, um, dealt a lot, dealt with NAFTA, and was very much involved. He says, this, this, is, this is probably the best mechanism you can have. It's a question of the balance. You have your trade regime, which is working, which is limping along, and we have a climate regime, which isn't even moving at all. So you need to, I think you need to harness something where you have an effective international regime, and you can harness that to promote our climate, you know, a strong international climate regime. Thanks. The key 
it seems to me is credibility because if you had a credible a credible club which include have to include china i think and and include all all the major actors then nobody would threaten it that that is it would never it would never be tested you never have to do this uh, anti anti wto or questionable trade policy because it would be a credible threat so the key it seems to me is getting yourself to a to a point of credibility where no one's going to challenge it well, can I just say I I, I I agree with that, but at the same time, th this is going to be whatever you do, it's going to be messy. I mean, the WTO is messy. You you know, we argue about airplanes, we argue about chickens, we argue about all these things. We've been arguing about that since the days of Pat Moynihan, and we're going to argue about that as long as we live. So these are messy regimes because there's such high stakes in them. Um, so I, I I think I'd like to have a regime that's important enough at least to be messy and to have these kinds of disputes. But now there are no disputes because there's no regime. So I'm going to move on to, uh, to Dean Kite with my my next question, uh, which relates to the question of infrastructure and implementation. Uh, green infrastructure, which the Biden uh, administration has emphasized, may be hard to differentiate, critics would think, from what is called pork in politics. Expensive projects funded by governments and designed to provide jobs and profits to communities uh, whose political representatives, I'm in Tip O'Neill's old district, have political influence. So Dean Kite, you have experience with implementation of infrastructure projects at global scale with the World Bank and elsewhere, and you have experience trying to assure wide access to uh, the benefits of, of, uh, of electric uh, technology globally. How should we think about implementing major infrastructure projects, including those focused on climate issues? Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Congratulations to the Academy on awarding this to Bill and congratulations, Bill. Uh, and what a moment uh, to be to be Bill, because now uh, I think there is, um, just to build off David's comments, something of a political alignment. Um, uh, there seems to be a point on the horizon to which China, the EU, the US and others are all headed. And the question really is, how do we get there? That, that point being, what is referred to as a sort of zero net carbon uh, economy. At the heart of that is infrastructure. Uh, I think President Biden has sort of joined this race to zero by putting on the table a $2 trillion in eight years uh, infrastructure plan. What's interesting about that is that it is uh, in large part a transportation plan. Transportation is, you know, uh, for, for, for many, many years, the one of the unsexy elements of the infrastructure uh, agenda. Certainly, if there's any transport people from the World Bank on the, the, the slide, they can testify to that. So 600 billion for infrastructure, 100 billion for water, um, 200 billion for housing, um, 180 billion for R&D. And I would agree with some of the comments that Bill was making about really needing to up the game in, in research and development. And then, um, you know, the international estimates are around, you know, $90 trillion uh, figure over the next decade for investment in green infrastructure globally. So whether you're in Pennsylvania or whether you are in Papua New Guinea, there is a huge infrastructure deficit, especially when we think about how infrastructure is going to have to be for the future. So this is the smart energy grids. This is the uh, clean transportation multimodal uh, systems of the future. This is completely rethinking and refurbishing the built environment. I mean, this is a massive overhaul uh, in order to meet the goals uh, that we've set for ourselves as a global community on climate. Now, what's interesting is that the policy instruments for that, um, uh, obviously at the heart of that is carbon pricing. But carbon pricing, most of the debate has been, and most of the practice has been around using carbon pricing in energy infrastructure. And here we do start to see a major pivot. Uh, obviously the energy in transition is somewhat underway in most countries. And there are real, there's a real feeling that that sort of is going to go faster and faster. And we saw the recent IEA report on readjusting its uh, prediction on how much renewable energy will come into the energy mix over the next 10 to 15, 20 years, revising by a factor of 25%, really, their ambition for that. Um, but now we start to see more and more focus on transport and infrastructure. And this is where uh, actually transport has stayed outside of most of the carbon pricing regimes that we've seen uh, around the world. And there's, in fact, a very robust debate for many years as to whether or not carbon pricing is an effective tool in trying to move uh, uh, transportation 
in, in the right direction. But there's something happening in transportation now. We've now started to see clubs, uh, not the kind of club that Bill was talking about, but clubs in shipping where you've got uh, alliances of ports, uh, fuel manufacturers, shipbuilders, ship owners, insurers, thinking about what would it take to sort of get to the point where you've got 5% of shipping fuel that would be net zero by 2030. They believe that that's a tipping point in actually changing the fueling of shipping. You've got agreements in the, in the aviation sector under Corsia, uh, which will start to see uh, regulations coming in there. I mean, what would a carbon club or carbon pricing regimes mean for, for, for aviation, which is behind the curve? And then of course, um, what is the policy mix for road transportation? Uh, obviously, there's a feeling that electric vehicles are beginning to take off in certain countries under positive uh, uh, um, policy environments, but now we're beginning to see both uh, electricity and trucking, but also the emergence potentially of a green hydrogen, hydrogen heavy goods vehicle uh, regime in certain places. Interestingly, Germany has indicated that it is going to be bringing um, a carbon pricing uh, regime into transport and buildings at the first time that they've sort of gone into detail about how they expect that to work. So is it pork? Um, well, uh, that depends. Um, uh, that depends on which era we're looking at infrastructure spending. It, certainly it used to be pork, pork was taken out, pork's back in fashion now because when you have a 50-50 Senate, uh, there, there are arguments that uh, um, letting everybody have uh, their fingerprints on success is actually a way to make the machine work. Uh, but I think that the, the narrative that has been pushed forward by the Biden administration, which other G7 countries are watching very closely, which is that uh, the race to a uh, net zero economy is one that uh, will be won by infrastructure and that infrastructure will benefit communities in particular communities which have been outside of the success of the economy of the last 10 to 20 years. So stitching together issues of equality, justice, uh, uh, the decarbonisation and then sort of access to services. I think that that's resonating uh, more broadly. And then just, I know that time is short, but we are in a race where we've got three big runners, China, the EU, and the US. And so the way in which the US pursues its infrastructure bill, the approach that it takes to pricing carbon and policy instruments within that, it, it does have to think about how that will align with the way that the EU is doing the same thing and the way that China is doing the same thing. And optimally, we will have an alignment in the way in which we set standards. So green hydrogen in the, in the United States, it would help if that's the same definition of green hydrogen that the EU is using. It would help if there is an alignment between the taxonomies and sustainable finance so that the financial sector is treating things and being treated the same way. And it would help if there was an alignment on pricing of carbon, not only in, in the amount, but on the ratcheting up and the aggression within that. And it, of course, it would help from the perspective of the carbon border adjustments with the fact that the EU seems quite intent on moving ahead. And despite uh, US signals that it doesn't think that's the right thing to do and certainly doesn't want it to be something that we're discussing this summer, it would like to see that discussed after the Glasgow climate talks. This is on the table. The final point I think is on Monday, uh, Lord Stern published a, a paper commissioned by Boris Johnson on what the G7 has to do. And if we think about the kinds of clubs, uh, then really the G7 has to be part of the leadership of this uh, aggressive move towards a cleaner, greener infrastructure around the world. And he, of course, mentions uh, uh, the need for a faster uh, progress in introducing carbon pricing, uh, higher prices, higher coverage, and a ratcheting up. Uh, but he also links that to structural policies that are needed, and also uh, to a recommendation that there be a really um, a step change in the focus on research and development, and I think then the deployment of those technologies into developing countries. Um, and so he puts uh, pricing very much in the centre of a suite of structural and other policies which the G7 should adopt for itself and then help the rest of the world adopt. So a timely conversation. Thank you, Dean Kai. Very good, concise statements. Um, if, 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 if carbon pricing is messy, aligning US and European policies, much less Chinese policy, would be very messy. They can't even align accounting policies. And if you've been to Europe, you know that you have to use a different electrical plug. So it's aligning policies, as you know, is difficult um, because they get locked in. Uh, uh, Bill, do you have any comments on this or shall I turn to the next question? Uh, just a brief comment. I, I mean, I, 
I think the problem I see with um, many of the infrastructure discussions is the lack of a kind of analytical background. And, and I think um, I think we heard a number of them. I'll just mention the three that I seem to be key to the extent they relate to, to um, climate change. And one is uh, externalities are a reason. That, that's a kind of reason for infrastructure and particularly the externalities with respect to research and development. That's a key. And that, that should be, um, as Lord Stern said, uh, that should be front and center. Uh, then there's another set of externalities, which are network externalities. We know mm -hmm. that markets have problems uh, with those. I, I'm still looking at my QWERTY keyboard. Uh, thank God I don't have an Apple keyboard because I don't know how to use it. Um, but I, I just the, the poster child here is electric charging stations. Uh, I, I, I can't drive I can't drive to Boston back because I don't have a charging station on the way. And then finally, there's a new element in this which uh, is important, which are behavioral issues and to the extent to which um, we have there are demonstrated and important behavioral anomalies that lead to excessive energy use, uh, those need to be addressed too. And those are those are really in the regulatory arena. So I agree very much with what you said. Sure. So we've talked in a different context in, in the last uh, couple of months about soft infrastructure like daycare center. There may be another form of, of infrastructure which is knowledge base in people's minds uh, to actually be able to, uh, to make uh, what they might consider the first sacrifices for the sake of the climate, uh, another issue. But let's turn to Professor Harrison. Uh, I have a question for her. Uh, it's, it's about targets, Catherine. Uh, targets get headlines and, and President Biden has set a, a target of 50% emissions cuts in the US by 2030. But as our discussion just now implies, targets can be pursued in different ways. Uh, sectoral policies can be added up to achieve targets, or a price on carbon could be instituted that, that reduce the need for, for sectoral targets. Well, what is your view, Professor Harrison, on sectoral policy and how it relates to a carbon price? Um, first off, I'd also like to extend my uh, congratulations to Professor Nordhaus on the Moynihan Prize, which is, of course, yet another prize that is so well deserved, um, recognizing his contributions. Um, so coming back to this question of sectoral regulations, sectoral targets, um, I think there's some very good reasons to take the sectoral route, uh, as David Victor and his co-author Danny Cullenwald have argued. There's stronger public support for regulating certain sectors, um, and certainly compared to broader carbon pricing, because consumers typically don't know how much money those sectoral regulations will cost them. Um, in addition, as my colleague Mark Jackard has argued, sectoral flex regs, um, sectoral standards that are designed to allow some trading within a sector, um, offer the promise of greater cost effectiveness sector by sector. Um, and last, we just need to do something. We have failed for so long. If there's a way forward that can get us moving and electricity and vehicles seem to be great places to start and big contrib um, contributors, then we should go for it. Um, but all that said, I'm not ready to give up on carbon pricing, um, at least as a complement to that sectoral strategy, one that could be more important over the long haul, especially if it's backed up by tariffs or border carbon adjustments, which I think is more likely. Um, and, and my reasons for that are that I worry a lot about um, opposition from organized incumbent industries, which often succeed in getting regulatory proposals watered down and probably more important in countries other than the US to have the regulations just not enforced. Um, I worry that the public support we've seen to date for regulations may not be sustainable as the ambition of those standards gets ramped up. And as we see those incumbent industries um, mounting campaigns to inform their consumers exactly how much those regulations are costing them. And the last thing, having watched um, environmental regulation for decades, is I worry about how long it takes to develop each one of those um, flex regs or traditional standards, and also whether because of that, will they be updated with the frequency that we're going to need to continue to build that momentum. So. 
Turning to carbon pricing, my own research is on the comparative politics of carbon taxes. And you know, one of the obvious findings is yes, it's politically challenging and there are some real disaster stories out there. Um, I would put Australia at the top uh, of that list and the US is certainly crashed and burned on the altar of carbon pricing before. But I also think there are some success stories that we can look to for lessons. Um, the EU ETS has not only made progress in um, strengthening its rules and it's uh, raising the price, but also has brought countries into that effective price-based cl um, climate pl club that wouldn't otherwise have been uh, engaged. Um, for the non-ETS emissions within the EU, we've got a country like Ireland that now has support among the major parties for increasing that country's carbon tax gradually till it gets to 100 euros per ton in 2030. And in Canada, where I live and work, uh, the current federal government has a, um, announced a schedule of increases to the national carbon price that would take Canada's current carbon price of about $40 uh, Canadian per ton to $170 Canadian per ton by 2030. So how did they do that? And what are the, the ways forward? I think there's four paths that I've seen. Um, the first is to do it for other reasons. France and Ireland initially adopted carbon taxes because they needed the money for other purposes. Uh, and I think the renewed emphasis on public investment um, that Dean Kite was discussing could provide that way forward, um, raise the money by taxing the bads in order to deliver the goods. Um, partisan conflict has been a huge obstacle because it's really easy for um, opportunistic politicians to play games and mislead voters. Um, but there are certain jurisdictions that have achieved multi-party consensus, or at least among the big parties. Um, through some combination of expert panel advice, citizens assembly, um, multi-party parliamentary committees, and also over time a change in government where we've seen the party that adopted a carbon price subsequently when they're in opposition are more willing to support um, changes in that policy at the margins. Um, a third strategy is to design the policies in, in ways that can build um, new coalitions or build supportive coalitions. Um, the BC carbon tax got industry on board through corporate tax cuts. Output-based allocation has, has proved important in getting large industrial polluters to at least accept carbon pricing. Um, revenue recycling to households is trickier. The, um, the dividends, uh, lump sum dividends that Canada and Switzerland have employed haven't been as successful as um, many expected at building public support. But I still think that over time, especially as the level of those checks increases, they may help lock in carbon pricing because it will be very difficult for um, subsequent politicians to take that money away from households once they're used to getting it every three months. And I think earmark spending is a sort of another version of that do it for other reasons strategy. And the last way forward that has been important in pretty much every case has been a political leadership. And I, I'm treading into uh, the perilous territory of political will, uh, which makes political scientists cringe, but it is the case that in the cases that I've studied that it, where there have been success, um, invariably either a political party or the leader of a political party has been willing to take a political risk by pursuing carbon pricing um, because they believe it's important. Now, I think that may be necessary in many cases, but it's not sufficient because of course, they have to get reelected. Um, and that's often turned on some combination of those other strategies. And in some cases, um, a little luck. And I'll, I'll stop with that. I'll be muted. Okay. You had lots of luck in British Columbia and not much luck in Australia. Um, uh, Bill, what, how, how about your response to this? To, to, to Catherine's interesting comments. Well, I thought those were wonderful and uh, very um, 
um, it's just a marvelous to hear someone who really knows about carbon carbon prices and carbon taxes in the kind of depth that uh, you do, Catherine. Um, I just have one comment, which is I, we are we are based in the United States and we're used to American exceptionalism. But in this case, the American exceptionalism is we are just stuck uh, marching backwards to the 18th century while the world marches ahead. Uh, there are something like 61 carbon price regimes in the world. Uh, the World Bank is uh, in their carbon price report, collects those and, and talks about those. Uh, they, they, they go from China to Korea, to Canada, to Mexico. They basically have a great divide around the United States uh, to Europe uh, and the EU and, and individual countries uh, and other kinds, many in South America as well. They are, they are fragmented but they're introduced. This is not, this is not just some gleam in, in the eyes of the economists uh, or, the, or the climate specialists. So if, if there's any exceptionalism, it's that the US uh, is not participating at the national level. And I, I think the lesson here is that we may have been too pessimistic about the, the possibilities in the United States for carbon pricing of different, who knows what kind, whether it's cap and trade or carbon tax or, or auctions, or there, there are many, many, many different variants. But I think, we, I think it would be helpful if we who think, uh, who want strong action would change our rhetoric a little bit and say, look, let's combine carbon pricing with strong support for research and development, low carbon technologies uh, and other network kinds of externality solutions. Uh, let, let's put these packages together and uh, find the political will and the, and the, and the political entrepreneurs uh, to put it forward. That's all, thanks. Good, well, this does relate, Bill, to your quote from Moynihan because the United States has stood out as an exception in a variety of ways and the lack of respect for international law is one of the outstanding ways, negative ways in which the US has stood out as very different from Europe, for example. Uh, and that was true in the 80s and the 90s and, and, and as well as since. Uh, so are there more comments by our panelists before I turn back for a last question to Bill? Uh, David, do you wanna say anything more about this or, or Rachel? Yeah, I, I just wanna say, um, I wanna pick up on one thing which is about the club. Um, Cause I think we glossed over very quickly a really critical question, which is who do you want in the club? So for example, for a long time, we thought it was crucially important to have China in the club because they're a big emitter. It's possible that today you have to trade away too much to get China in the club in a meaningful way. And it might be that you wanna start with a smaller club that's more credible, as you said, Bob, that um, has a greater capability to apply whatever border measures are gonna be necessary as Bill has rightly laid out. So I think there's some real trade-offs in terms of the membership. Um, and it could well be that this looks a lot like the early days of the Montreal Protocol, where you have a basically a club of the transatlantic countries plus Japan, I would think Korea now as well. And, um, and they demonstrate cred credibility. They actually bend the curves uh, in their countries. They manage the politics um, and they then uh, in effect hold their markets hostage to other countries um, lining up. And, you know, I think just because of where we are geopolitically, the assumption that the Chinese must be there at the beginning, I think that assumption needs to be questioned to a greater degree. This, this relates to Bill's point about technology, because the key, as you know better than I, to Montreal was that it didn't cost very much to get rid of the CFCs, because new technological developments uh, made it easy and, and in fact profitable for the big companies to use substitutes. Uh, so this gets back to Bill's point that it, we might need a common, if you have a small club, you might need to combine that with a, with a really strong technological push to try to make sure that you drive the cost of being in the club down. Because if the club is, is very small, it, it can't coerce uh, China. And so it has to be not too costly to be in it. Otherwise it will itself fall apart. Yeah, and I think the more successful we are on the network effects with technology, the politics also become a little bit easier, more than a little bit easier, because the costs come down and becomes less toxic to work on, on, on decarbonization. So there's a, 
there's a there's a an externality that is um, the social benefit from innovation, and there's an externality that, frankly, is a political benefit from innovation, and and the two together are strongly reinforcing. So this brings me to my final question before we turn to uh, uh, our audience uh, and and turning back to Bill Nordhaus. A, a National Academy's report on decarbonization this winter emphasize the importance of a robust research and development budget to develop new technologies. It also proposed a, a new set of institutions, including a green bank capitalized initially at, at $30 billion and a formal national carbon budget with provisions for changing policy if the US is falling short of the path. Uh, the technology uh, uh, suggestions maybe didn't have very much about the interaction between private enterprise uh, and technological change, as Bill has pointed out to us in the discussion we had yesterday. So do these proposals, Bill, make sense to you? And which, which of the National Academy's proposals would you emphasize? Yeah, after, um, I had not read it that carefully. And so I went back and read it after our, our, just for those of you who are listening, we had a meeting yesterday to prepare. And so Bob had mentioned this. So I went back and read it again. I read part of it before. So as I look at it, well, it's, any National Academy report is an alliance. <laughs> it's an alliance of scholars and activists and people from industry. And this is, this is clearly one of those. Uh, but it's an alliance that re I'd say rests on um, one, two or three major components. One major component is a carbon price, a carbon, not a carbon tax, but carbon price, could be a carbon tax. Uh, and it's extremely ambitious. It it's, uh, starts out and it goes to about $250 a ton in 2050, and I think something like $2,500 a ton in 2100. Uh, I'd say God save the public finance people uh, trying to deal with that, but that's another question. So it's a very ambitious carbon pricing. And then I think it, to get consensus, it looked like you, have, you had to get people to say, well, carbon pricing won't do it because of X, Y, Z. So there were some other things. One important one was the research and development, but actually it was kind of buried. Um, and you, you had to look very hard to find the importance of, of, of inducing low carbon technologies. And all the emphasis was on public support. And there's no emphasis at all on inducing private companies to develop low carbon technologies. So I thought it was, um, I thought it was a little bit misguided and definitely underemphasized. And then the other issues, there were a few things on network externalities, but many things I think were, were less important. So the, the three things I took from that were uh, very useful. One was the carbon pricing, which had now come center stage after being off, kind of off the stage and in the, in the wings, so to speak, for many years. The second was the recognition of the importance of, uh, of enhanced research and development, although underplaying the private side of that, which will be very important, and then uh, some infrastructure issues as well. Uh, I, I thought it was, um, it, it would have benefited from some slimming because there are too many, that, there's so many recommendations that you can just pick, anybody will find six that they completely agree with. and. Uh, I think it would have been a better report if it had been a little more focused, but it, it did hit the key points. Thanks. Uh, uh, the, uh, the question of, uh, that you raised in our discussion yesterday uh, about private, the private sector relationship to R&D made me think that, could we think about this problem as a, as a triangle among, scientists in the first place, because the basic research is done by government funded science typically before you reach the point of where it's where it can be uh, made, made commercial. Uh, the second sector of uh, the second element of this triangle is uh, uh, private uh, capital and private um, technology funds, uh, 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 development funds, uh, profit, profit oriented to take advantage of, of the science. And the third, of course, is government spending, is government investment. And do we lack an institutional framework for putting these together? Is it, is it too haphazard? Or is it right to have it be haphazard and, that, and, and let it come from, from below with opportunities spotted by entrepreneurs or not spotted by entrepreneurs? What, what do you think? Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think that's a com I don't have that. I don't have a, a, a firm answer to that. I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, one is, I, I do think I was very much influenced by the vaccine development over the last year. I think it was a, a, a really interesting example of how um, so smart, targeted government, government interventions can make a big difference. If you remember back um, 12, 13, 14 months ago, we were told no vaccine has been developed in less than four years. We were told there's not been a vaccine for HIV after all of these years. We say we will be lucky if we get it in a year or two. And, and we know what happened. Not only did we get it, but we got, we got, a, vac we got a new type of vaccine that's a really a mir miracle of modern medicine. Uh, but what didn't just happen, it didn't just happen because uh, the market spoke and the market brought it, it was very strong government support, not just the patent system, which is an obvious one for intellectual property, intellectual property ownership, but also pre-purchase agreements, also direct funding. Uh, but one of the interesting things is, uh, if we think of the pre-purchase agreements as an example, is not just shoveling money out to support um, companies, but also have targets. It's like, it's like the military, you do, we're not gonna just shovel money to an, to an airline company, to, airplane co to produce airplanes. We're gonna have a fly off to see if the thing can actually do what it's supposed to do. So I think there's a, for me at least, there was a kind of inspiration there to see if, if we have, we focus on it, we have targets and we use some of these new and interesting uh, uh, instruments for technology. I, I think that can be, that can, potentially accelerate greatly. And I would, just the last point, I would emphasize what David Victor said. Uh, technology, technology is not gonna do this alone because it, it needs some incentives to do it. But if we can do it more inexpensively, if we can make the transition cheaper, that helps with the politics. It helps with Carbon, getting uniform carbon pricing. It helps with the border issues. It helps with everything. And so these, and the high carbon prices help induce innovation in the private sector. So these are very much interlocking strategies. So I really, I, I'm really glad you raised that uh, for two reasons. One, one is it, it looks like when, what NASA is doing with Musk versus Bezos, I think that is, uh, it's a fly off, right? For who, who, can, who can put their, uh, their rockets up better. Uh, but the other point is that I'm glad you made it because this is from a, a political point of view, a point that nobody is making because neither side has an incentive to make it. Uh, uh, the Republicans should brag about it, but they don't want to brag about government intervention. Uh, and they don't want to emphasize COVID because Trump made just, uh, such a mess of it. So they don't want to talk about it. The Democrats don't want to talk about it because it's a triumph of the Trump administration, which actually did this. So neither side has an incentive to say what you just uh, said, said so cogently because they have political reasons to shut up about it. Uh, so uh, it's rare that politicians shut up. I'm just commenting that this is the case where they're both shutting up. Uh, David and Catherine and Rachel, do you have other comments you'd like to make before we turn to the audience? I think Tom will, will, will have curated some questions from them. I think we should hear from the audience. <laughs> You've all been very eloquent and very concise. I really appreciate it. So, Tom, from the audience, what's the what's the first offering? Actually, I'm going to do uh, two at the first time or at the same time because they both have to do with sort of contemporary dynamics. The first comes from Sam Manley. I'm going to paraphrase Sam. Um, back to Professor Nordhaus's talk, and these are both to the whole panel, not just to Bill. Back to Professor Nordhaus's talk, you left out 2020 from your first graph, but 2020, of, uh, as many of us would expect, would be a use, might be a useful year to look at because of much limited travel, reduced emissions, et cetera. What can we reasonably expect to learn from 2020? What do we know so far? And might it uh, help us effectively target future climate policy? And then the second is um, about the uh, Biden proposal. The Biden administration is proposing clean energy. This is from Marissa Elisa Vollmer. The Biden administration is proposing a clean energy standard. Do you see that turning into a cap and trade mechanism? Well, let me say about 2020. I think the lesson from 2020 
is if you're willing to go back to the Stone Age standard of living, you can reduce your emissions a lot. But I think it's no model for, at least for me, for how to tackle climate change, to have a horrible pandemic where people have to spend, the, spend a year in their home, they can't travel, they can't see anybody, they can't see their families, they can't travel, because they can't travel, they don't drive, and they don't emit any emissions. That, that's somebody model, but it's not my model. Um, on the, uh, I don't know the answer to the second question. I think every democratic administration, as far as I remember, has always wanted to try to find a way to introduce a cap and trade system administratively using, using existing law. And I don't, uh, I, I've, heard, I've heard discussions of that. And I just don't think it's worked. Uh, it, may, it, might, it might be worth a try. Uh, but uh, I think I just don't, I don't know that there's the authority. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't know there's authority and it's been tried and thought about by some very, very talented lawyers. So I, I, I think people are thinking about it, but I think, it's a, I think it's gonna be very difficult to do from what I've seen. Well, let me recall that 10 years ago, the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court only ruled five to four in, in, in Mass versus EPA that the, uh, uh, that uh, of the EPA could regulate greenhouse gases. And that would not be a five to four decision in that direction now with the current court. So that's a, another problem. Other, other, other responses to that question? Well, well on the, the clean energy standard, uh, David may want to uh, add to this bit. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, so a clean energy standard basically is sort of technology neutral portfolio standard for, uh, for, for, for energy. So what well, I think the biggest effect that it has is that it forces the utilities and forces the suppliers of energy to, to, to move more quickly to, to clean energy. So it has that scale effect. Uh, I think it's, I, I see certainly anecdotally in my reading, it is embraced by the progressive side of the Democratic Party who uh, themselves are not terribly keen on, on, on pricing carbon, certainly in certain ways. And so I'm not sure it leads to uh, a cap and trade, but it certainly, um, you know, leads to um, then accompanying policy measures so that you really uh, ensure that that cleaner energy that has to be produced because you've got clean energy standard, and then you put associated policies around it to make sure that that energy is affordable and is baked into um, uh, all of the other things you have to do to make sure that that's universally available, right? So you've got to have clean energy and you've got to have clean energy that is affordable and reliable and, and, and available to everybody, which is not the case in the United States and not the case in most countries. So I see it as, I, I see it as a, a very, um, you know, interesting way to drive the, especially the electricity uh, part of the problem. And of course, the theory of change being that you, you clean up electricity, electrify everything, have that electricity be clean, and then we deal uh, with the hard to abate sectors, which in and of themselves are moving. And that we would need, you need effective pricing of carbon and other um, standard setting if you're going to be able to support a, a green hydrogen industry or you're going to support um, heavy manufacturing, heavy transportation. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's definitely um, uh, a, you know, something that would lead to scale, whether it leads to cap and trade, I'm not sure. Okay, Tom, how about the next question? Well, I think this one might actually build on just a little bit of what Rachel was just talking about. It comes from Myron Straff. As one initial step, what about providing incentives to countries not directly on CO2 emissions, but on achieving efficiencies in one or two sectors by implementing low carbon technologies? For example, a percent of licensed vehicles that are electric or hybrid or percent of electricity generated by renewable sources. Hey, Bill, do you want to comment on this? I, I just think that's a way to madness. I mean, there, there are just too many, there are too many cars, there are too many industries, there are too many countries. Uh, there, there are too many activities that use uh, or don't use uh, fossil fuels. Um, it's, it's, such, it's such a blunt instrument. And I mean, it's just, my, my aesthetic sense says something that's simple is a carbon price. And the other thing about a carbon price, which is not often uh, recognized, is it makes our lives sim simple. I don't have to worry about my carbon footprint 
because my carbon footprint is contained in the pricing and I can go about my daily life not worrying about my, I can worry about other things like war and peace, life and death, uh, whether my students are learning and, and not spend all my time worrying about my carbon footprint because the, my carbon footprint is embedded in the price system of everything I buy. So uh, I, I just think going these other routes is just, just going to raise many, many more diff problems in itself. If I, if I could just say that, that there, there is a, there's a very, very important point in the discussion around the global sort of needs for infrastructure and the global sort of recovery from the economic impacts of COVID and the need to build back better or, or come back greener, depending on uh, how you frame it. For, for, for most emerging markets and developing countries, they are in the middle of a liquidity crisis, the size and scale of which we have not seen in modern economic times. They are very clear uh, that they um, will need uh, access to capital markets at a reasonable price. They are going to need support, access to technology. They're going to need, uh, uh, they would like to see a commensurate offer for investment in green infrastructure um, if, if, if they are not to continue on the path that they're on at the moment. The, the largest investor in energy infrastructure in in the developing world for the last 10 to 20 years has been China through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so this is, this is a moment of uh, a real decision about engagement in the world because there is a need for those countries that got us to this point of climate change to invest in the capability of these countries to move through their own transitions. Uh, and that's going to, those are gonna have to be clean transitions. And so this starts to ask really big questions of uh, how the uh, Bretton Woods institutions do their job, the rules that they use, uh, their purpose even. Uh, um, and I think you'll start, you're starting to see between Brussels and Washington with London a little bit because it's the president of the G7, but also with China, India and elsewhere, the starting of a conversation around, okay, um, let's, what, are the, what can we help? How, how does the IMF help with this? Uh, what are the resources we put in, into the multilateral system, including the MDBs, to be able to help with this? And then what, in addition, do we need to mobilize uh, in, in terms of public money, mobilizing private money, and how do we start to invest in, at scale? But most developing countries, and you listen to the African finance ministers, you know, they have a set of things that they want to see, which go to the heart of the trading regime, the heart of how these kinds of policies are introduced in the future. I don't, I don't think they need targets. Uh, they, they, they want um, a sort of commitment over the next 10 to 20 years that, uh, uh, that there will be um, uh, sort of, in their words, fairness in, in the way in which the international system operates. And of course, they have much to do themselves in, in sorting out their own domestic investment priorities. Thank you, that's very, very important comment and certainly a consistent theme, as well as the theme of not making progress on climate change, is that, uh, the rich countries not delivering on their promises uh, to developing countries. That goes back to 1949. <laughs> so, and it's an unbroken record, I think, of uh, failure. Uh, Tom, probably one, one more question from the audience. Yep, last one. This one's from uh, Michael Foyer. Uh, resistance to carbon tax, as Bill noted, is higher for gasoline cars than in other sectors. If some of that resistance is due to unequal burden on people lower on the income distribution, is there an estimate of the extent of the regressivity and perhaps more important, any way to imagine some way to compensate those people? The basic idea, obviously, is that we assume the, so that we assume social, uh, the social benefits justify at least some level of individual costs but would we have less trouble implementing such uh, an idea if it were more clearly paying attention to ways to acknowledge and compensate people who were otherwise, uh, who otherwise are asked to bear what seems to be unfair burdens? That's a great question. Bill and I had a little exchange on that in the last day or so. So I'll ask Bill his expert view on this. Well, I'm, I might ask Catherine on this, but <laughs> because uh, I, I, British Columbia is, I think, the role model in how to answer that question, which is if you use uh, a mechanism that raises revenues when you limit carbon emissions, such as a carbon tax or auctions of, of uh, emissions allowances, then you raise revenues. And when you can use those revenues 
to turn what would otherwise be a regressive program in terms of its fiscal impact into a progressive program by doing it, say, on a per capita rebate. So there's absolutely no reason it has to be regressive. No, no intellectual reason. Of course, it could turn into one. Um, but I think one other thing I think is often, often overlooked is that um, to the extent that carbon pricing and uh, is, um, is a policy that reduces the use of coal, it has big public health benefits outside of the climate benefits. And those are very, very progressive because the damages, the public health damages from air pollution are very much felt very much more by low income and central city and minority population. So particularly the benefits of these plus the possible fiscal use, I think is a way of answering that question. Catherine, do you have a comment on this? Since Absolutely. Was happy, raised. happy to chime in on this one. I mean, I think there's an assumption that carbon taxes are regressive, but countries are all different. In countries where people, where low-income households don't own cars, um, you know, the, the situation from the get-go may be very different than it would be in the United States. And that even includes Canada, where uh, electricity tends to be uh, from zero carbon sources for the most part. Um, the, the, fact again that there's money that can that comes in that can be used to fix regressivity if it's an issue is an important one um, beyond British Columbia's experience the current um, Canadian federal tax and dividend which applies in um, to most most provinces in Canada uh, eighty percent of households are getting more money back than they are paying so it's an extremely progressive policy and my last point would be um, one thing we almost never talk about is the regressivity of some regulatory policies. Um, and and I, I think that's a challenge because they're popular. Often they are popular with some of the same people that they're hurting and uh, greater transparency there could be helpful. Thank you. There, there is a debate in the economics literature even on how regressive uh, these, these, um, uh, these taxes or, or cap and trade prices are. Uh, there's a paper by, by Larry Goldner just a couple of years ago, which denies that, that they're regressive, even without the payments that you and Bill have both talked about. He may be wrong, but there's it's certainly within somehow within the margin of debate in the economics profession, whether they are significantly regressive, even without the rebates. So I want to thank all the panelists. This was a terrific discussion. And Bill, most of all, excellent comments and great responses. But all three of the, of the other panelists I thought added a lot to our discussion and they were all concise and to the point. So I wanna thank you very much and I wanna call it, turn back to Tom and maybe Ken for final thanks. Well, I have this to say um, to uh, uh, Bill and, 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 and Bob and David and Rachel and Catherine, I have a special technology on my computer and it records a standing ovation. Uh, it's very enthusiastic out there, and they send you their thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll close it off now. Everybody can leave, and we're right on time. And thanks, everybody. For